No illusions. We're speaking here today uh, on your birthday. Yeah, 46 today. So, I mean, are you having that moment? Are you like getting all existential, you know, like? I don't think so. Everybody keeps telling me I'm supposed to, right? I was supposed to freak out at 30. I was supposed to freak out at 40. And now I'm supposed to freak out every year, but uh, not yet, not yet. I, I, I have a sneaking suspicion it's gonna sneak up and hit me all at once. Though. So you, you know, you host a bunch of stuff, but obviously scathing atheist, would you call that sort of the, the beginning of this journey, right? Yeah, yeah, that was our first show. Are you still scathing? I oh. mean. Absolutely. I'll tell you, you know, it used to be that I was scathing on my behalf. Now I'm scathing on my listeners' behalf. <laughs> you know, they're the ones that feed it to me because I, I you know, I, I do this for a living now, like yourself. I'm at home all the time. I don't go to an office. I don't, you know, listen to my religious co workers anymore. Everybody that I work with is an atheist. Everybody I socialize with generally is an atheist. But I still get the, the listeners that, that write into me and tell me about their experiences, and they are the fuel now for the scathing. Do you uh, still pissed off? I mean, scathing came from somewhere, right? I mean, was that was that it? Like, like screw religion kind of thing, or what? Absolutely, it, it, it's less screw religion than screw religion's effect on society, obviously. And I thought I was starting to calm down. I thought I was starting to get over it about five years ago, and then they elected Trump, and I found a whole new well of scathing. You know. <laughs> Um, and I realized that it is at least as dangerous as I was afraid it was when we first started doing this. Tell me about the book. What's the title? It's called Outbreak, A Crisis of Faith, How Religion Ruined Our Global Pandemic. It's funny because I was talking to astrophysicist Dr. Dan Batcheldor. We were actually having breakfast this morning at a convention. And uh, I said, you know, I saw this post on the internet which actually made a lot of sense. You know, you, when you watch a contagion movie, and at the end, they come up with the antidote, and everybody on the planet takes it, and humanity is rescued. <laughs> we know that's never going to happen now, right? We know that there will be no, hey, everybody will take the, the shot, and they will all be inoculated, because the hashtag freedom crowd is probably going to wave their flags and banners and, and talk microchips and shit. I mean, well, what's the book focus on specifically? Well, so the book was written very early on in the pandemic. Over the first two or three weeks, actually, we sat down, me and my partners, Eli Bosnick and Heath Enright, we looked at what was going on in the news and we saw ahead to exactly what you're talking about, right? To the fact that there was going to be massive resistance to this. And of course, because the religious right had put their people in power leading up to it uh, and people were being put into scientific positions based on ideology rather than scientific credentials, they had already made it worse before it happened. And of course, we could see then that they were in the act of making it yet even worse. So in the book, I argue, and again, this was for the first few weeks of the pandemic, that religion made it worse beforehand, during, and will continue to make it worse after, and, and the after in this instance was after we had a vaccine, which of course turned out to be exactly the case. Yeah, it's crazy to watch people who, who have such a blasé attitude about the basic precautions to help protect their fellow human beings, especially among this Christian love crowd. Ah, it makes you nuts. Uh, you get uh, any feedback from the believers on what you do? Yeah, here and there, you know, I, I have uh, still a few religious friends that are hangers on for a very long time, and, and I still get uh, the, the main feedback I get is that the, you know, the idea that it's a type of demonization that I just blame every single problem on religion, that I always find the angle by which that I, I can blame religion no matter who's really at fault. And I, I think that just really underestimates the number of problems that religion is the root of. That's not my Jesus. You know, yep. I mean, whenever yep. you, you go to a literal chapter and verse in the Bible and you're like, well, this is what it says. And this is what Jesus said. And they'll just blankly look at you and say, well, that's not my Jesus. Right, yes. <laughs> where, where are you getting your Jesus from? Like they are custom fitting, like they're a religion in their own image, you know. And it's an ever moving goalpost. Like you deal with this all the time. Like, well, Christianity at its center, at its fundamentals says this. And they just look at you and go, no, it doesn't. And what do you do with that, right? Right. Well, you know, I find it really interesting. When I first started doing the podcast, one of the first things we did, we said, you know, we're going to have to read the Bible. I'm going to have to read it cover to cover. I'd never read it before. I just knew what the religious people said was in it, what the atheist said was in it. Figured this is going to really help me out as an atheist. I have actually read the Bible. And it, and it did. And it was useful. 
But because so few of the Christians had actually read it, it wasn't particularly useful in terms of figuring out what their mindset was. I find that I learn a lot more from watching their movies than I ever did from reading their Bible, from sharing their entertainment, listening to their music, as you so uh, did for so long. You know, you learn a lot more of what the true theology of the person you're dealing with is from the entertainment that they consume than you do from the, the holy book that they, you know, wear nice and thin so they can read 16 passages over and, and over again. You know, I did a speech on this about how if the church can't stay relevant theologically, scientifically, historically, morally, it remains relevant culturally, right? It's yeah. the tribe we have, the songs we sing, our jewelry, our t-shirts, our games, the places where our kids connect. You know, it's one of those things where people don't know it, but they know it's true. What's that line about uh, Christianity is like a software license, right? You just yeah. scroll to the mm -hmm. bottom and click, I agree. You brought up the Christian films. You're still doing god-awful movies. Oh, yeah. Christian movie every week till the day I die, apparently. I, uh, I, if you had the chance to shake hands with Kevin Sorbo right now, you would probably leap at that opportunity? Like, would it be like meeting God himself? <laughs> Man, you know, I'll tell you, the thing is, is that it, it's funny, because one of these days I am gonna have that, you know, I'm gonna meet Kevin Sorbo, I'm gonna be like, I've seen all your movies, Kevin, and he's gonna go, oh, you're a fan, and I'm like, no, no, I hate you. <laughs> I hate everything about you. But, uh, but no, you know, the honest truth is that there are a couple of people in the Christian movie universe that I, I would love to meet and I'd love to shake their hands and, 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 and talk to them about the, the work they do. But there are also some people who are so malicious and insidious in the messages they're putting out in the world, Kevin Sorbo among them, uh, that I just feel like if I met him, it would probably be best if he and I did not speak. You feel that way about David A.R. White? Absolutely, or? yeah. Like yeah. they're just doing, of course I'm being facetious, like it's not, a great admiration. I think it's more like they've been sort of in your zip code and you've seen them right. in the abstract on screen for so long yeah. that like the flesh and blood encounter would be surreal, right? Absolutely. So, I mean, who are some of the other, I don't know, are they Z-list Hollywood types? I've seen uh, several people who I, they seem to have jumped from secular Hollywood to pure flicks. I mean, any names come to mind off the top of your head? or Well, if you were a big fan of sitcoms in the 80s, a lot of them get ruined for you, right? Like uh, John Ratzenberger, uh, Cliff from Cheers, he shows up in a ton of them. Uh, Harry Anderson from Night Court is in it was in a bunch of Christian movies. Corbin Burnson is in a lot of them. So, you, you know, it, it, it's... You know, I think for some of these people, it's the same thing as how they get into Christian music, right? They, you know, they couldn't quite make it in secular music. The bar is a little bit lower here in Christian movies. They're just happy to have somebody that anybody recognizes very often. And so, you know, for some of these people, I'm sure that that's the work they can get. And I really can't begrudge them that. I mean, that's know? the cynic in me, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, are they a true believer or are they getting paid? Right. right? Or do they have a gig finally, you know? So. Right. But there are some movies where the messages are so insidious that I can't be that forgiving. You know, look, if you're, if you're participating in homophobia, in, in, in anti-trans bigotry, in misogyny, these types of things that, that are very often central to these messages, I can't forgive it because it's a job, you know? Melissa Joan Hart, right? I mean, yeah. the God's Not Dead films, how many do they have to make before the point is made? You know, like at some point, God would have to show up and say, by the way, I'm not dead. Like, why would he need a film series to? Uh... But, you know, the, the plots of these are just bizarre. You know, like Christianity is illegal. So they go into a courtroom and the charges are never really specified. Uh, the vibe is what? It's illegal to be a Christian? Yeah. So that was God's Not Dead 3, the one with Melissa Joan Hart, where they were, they, she would, or was that 2? I think that was two, actually, now that I think they're, they're you all bleeding. You've seen a lot of them whenever they blur together yeah, in your right, mind. Right. Yeah, right, right. The God's Not dead verse now is all, uh, you, you got to watch them chronologically, not in the order they came out. That's the key. No, so, so that one, you know, she said Jesus, at a th in, in, as an example, as an answer to some kid's question in class, she was like, well, what's a historical example of somebody who did this? And she said, well, Jesus Christ, for example, and, and so and so and so and so. And they sued her because she said Jesus Christ in the schools. And she goes to court. I mean, and everything in that movie happens except she gets raptured from the witness stand you know it's just ridiculous but it's gotten so much worse we're now on god's not dead 4 which was released in theaters between a tuesday and a thursday in like january or something like that you know so i mean they make them cheaply and yep. honestly people are 
paying. Somebody's paying. I think yeah. the first God's Not Dead rolled in 60 mil. And you know, they made it for about five bucks. Yeah. No, I actually happen to have those numbers off the top of my head. $2 million budget for a $64 million worldwide gross. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's commerce. And we see this in uh, sort of this... Uh, Christian music has what we call God or girlfriend songs. There's, it depends on kind of the genre you're listening to, the type of Christian music. But they like to do this crossover thing where they sing about love and beauty. And yeah, it can be Yahweh or Jesus, or it can be your girlfriend mm -hmm. kind of thing, you know. And uh, it's this weird thing that Christianity does where you have these sort of hardcore Christianity will soon be illegal films. And then you have these weird, misty, Hallmark movie ethereal, God is in the ether, he's a spiritual, I don't know, have you seen any of that shit out there? I mean... Yeah, you know, it, it's funny because those all came about after uh, Mel Gibson made Passion of the Christ, right? That movie made $600 million, Hollywood went nuts, they all started buying up or starting their own Christian subsidiaries immediately after. So if you look at the, like the 20 top grossing Christian movies of all time on Box Office Mojo, 10 of 20 of them came out since 2014, 19 of 20 of them came out since 2004, since Passions of the Christ. Right, that's when Hollywood really started pumping money into that, and they made the most, by and large, the most theologically anodyne movies they possibly could, right? <laughs> the thing that's not gonna piss off the guy who goes to, you know, the Joel Osteen mega church, non denominational. The motivational speaker exactly. kind of Christian. Exactly. The, the spiritual but not religious folks. They're always the same, it's always a sick or injured kid. Right? Um, a bunch of doctors do a bunch of science and a bunch of religious people do a bunch of prayers and who knows how the kid got better, right? It could have been either of them. And that's the movie. Yeah, Mel Gibson, you drop his name back in the church and this was still when I was a believer, right? Churches were busing congregants yes. out to Passion of the Christ, which oh. is ironic. It's like a rated R, hard R gore fest, you know? And uh, they would hold altar calls at the end of Passion. It was a big religious thing. And of course, then it comes out that he's like, you know, the domestic abuse charges, and he's talking about how the Jews are responsible for all the wars in the world. And he's just, he's a horrible human being. And the church just sort of got nervously quiet. Like, it's not even that they came out and spoke out against him, it's just that they were like, oh shit, like, what are we gonna do now? Right. <laughs> you know? right. Well, so. keep in mind he's Catholic. It's not they're, like they're not used to dealing with some controversy here and there by just ignoring it. So, so what are like if there? I know you get asked this question. Forgive me for asking it again, but if you had to choose one that was the worst of the worst, like the movie I had to sit through that made me want to just rip my own skin off. Oh, okay. So that would be. It's it's so funny because. There's very little that separates my favorite from my least favorite, right? Because they're it's basically the same criteria. Yeah, the one you love to hate and the one you hate. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Um, so I'd say the hardest one to ever watch that we ever did, there was a movie we did called Loving the Bad Man about a woman who was raped and uh, decided against her family's uh, uh, urging not to have an abortion, to have the kid, and it was all about her learning to forgive her rapist and let him be a part of the kid's life. And every message within that movie was poison. There was so much, you can reform your abusive partner, you can, uh, you, you owe it to your rapist to bring them to Jesus. It was just such despicable messaging that there was no way to have fun with it, right? Like a lot of the movies we do, they're terrible. The messages in them might even be misogynistic or homophobic or terrible in, in some other way. Um, but they're usually so bad that you can still make jokes about them. That movie was so poisonous. It was just, you know, it was, it was we could barely even do a review on it on our show. Yeah, how did you handle it on God Awful Movies? Did you just approach it more like uh, a dissection, like a serious dissection? So what we did on that one is we we brought in some very sensitive friends. Of, no, we had Tom and Cecil on, actually. It was a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, there's the 800-pound gorilla in the china shop. It's not even, I don't even know if it's a china shop, if it's GAM, but I mean, I'm sure you guys just eviscerated the film. Oh, yeah, yeah. We actually did that one live in Chicago on stage. So it was a, it was a you know, the, the audience let us know how far we could go, I think, which was useful. Is live GAM like riff tracks? Kind of, I mean, how do you guys do a live show about Christian films? It's the same as the show that we normally do where we just kind of walk the audience through the, the movie movie from the beginning to the end and, and, and just sort of riff on it along the way, point out the poisonous messages that you get um, and, uh, you know, and, and just try to make it a good, 
uh, garden uh, for jokes. And, is it a comedy and, show? You yeah. call it a comedy show? Absolutely. Yeah, is it true? Right. Did I see a screenshot of uh, Eli Bosnick walking out and he was wearing like a, is it a diaper? I mean, what the hell is going on at these shows, dude? Like, does he just decide he's going to show up in some new outrageous get up every week or what? Pretty much, yeah. So it all started as a gag at our very first live show we did in New York. It was Passion of the Christ, actually, that we did. And uh, Eli said, hey, I got this great idea for a joke. You come out first, and then Heath will come out, and then I'll come out in my underwear. <laughs> and, and you'll say, Eli, where the hell are your clothes? And I'll say, well, you said to just wear what I normally wear to record. And so he did that. And I, I told him, I'm like, Eli, that's hilarious. I can't ask you to do that, but you can offer to do it, I guess. <laughs> So you need plausible deniability. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. I, 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 could you sign this paper saying that I never urged you to? So he does that, and of course he he hikes his his underwear up into his butt as he does it, so that as he walks away, he moons the entire audience. And from that point on, I think he's just felt the need to one up that over and over again. So but there's got to be a line. There has to be a point where somebody, like one of your hosts, is like. Look, we've heard about this guy. He is not allowed to X or Y or whatever. Right? So we have a we have a, we're one of the very few podcasts that has a full time lawyer on retainer <laughs> on our staff. Like we literally have a lawyer that we have to run scripts by and say, hey, is it okay to say this or how would I phrase this so it's not directly a threat to a Supreme Court justice, that kind of stuff, you know. Is the Christian film industry mostly pure flicks these days? They seem to be the most, I, I hate to use the word slick because they're not really slick. Mm -hmm. They're slick in the sense that Christians might think it's slick, I don't know. But I mean, are they mostly doing this stuff or is, are, there, are there other companies right now producing content? Right. There, the pure flicks, I think, are, are probably the most prolific, but there are a ton of different production companies at this point. So you have three tiers, essentially. You have the top tier. This is like a firm films and, and I think, relevant. But they, they, these are um, the ones that are owned by Sony, owned by Disney, owned by the big production companies, right? The, 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 the Hollywood Big Five or Big Six. It's, it's Big Five now. It's Big Six when they started to buy all of these up. And then Pure Flix is part of that top tier of independent producers. Uh, they put out a ton of stuff. Um, and then there's this lower tier, which is, man, that's bread and butter for me. That's, <laughs> there's a website called ChristianCinema.com, and that's where they put the movies that Pure Flix won't even touch, the truly despicably... Now, is it a satirical movies. site, or are they playing it straight? No, the they are absolutely playing it straight, although when you watch the movies, you do have to ask yourself that question a few time. We uh, watched a movie, I, I don't know if I was guesting on your show, but it was uh, When Footman Tire, <laughs> What Will Horses Do? Did I remember the title? If, if Footman Tire You, What Will Horses Do? That's my favorite worst movie that I've ever Is seen it? right there. Yeah. With uh, Estes Perkel. Yes. Who I think had a weird violence fetish against children, right? Because he's got this film, this apocalyptic film, which was what, 80% of him behind a podium. And then the rest of it was, you know, they're ramming sticks through the throat of a child and all this kind of stuff, right? Yeah. You, you think some of the people speaking out against all of these quote-unquote sins secretly fetishize them and fantasize about them? You think this is a repressed expression of something they secretly want? I know you, this is all just speculation, but... Mm. Obviously, but yeah, when you watch some of their movies, it's hard to believe otherwise, you know, especially Astis Perkle. He worked with a director named uh, Roy Ormond, uh, who was a, a slasher film director before he found Jesus and realized there was a lot more money in this business. Those two things happened simultaneously. Who knows if one had anything to do uh, with the other. And yeah, like you said, the catch-up budget on that movie was insane. Every scene is just <laughs> splattered with fake blood. He did three or four movies uh, with Roy Ormond, and they were all like that. They were all just horrifically violent. Island. And for no reason, there's a there's a point where one character has to get killed. I can't remember the name of the movie, but one of his movies is a character has to be killed in, a, in an auto accident. So he has him beheaded on a motorcycle, and it's just like, why? Why would you do it? <laughs> why add a severed head when you don't need a severed head? You could show a you know like a wide shot of a car with smoke. And that's know, all and we needed. The crushed front end and no body, and they'd get the point, right? right? I see that reflected in like these uh, hell houses on Halloween. You ever heard about those? You know, you go in and there's a bloody gang shooting and here's an abortion scene and here's a suicide scene and there's blood all over the walls. I mean, it's crazy. You know, it makes Tarantino look like Sesame Street, but they're doing it to try to shock you 
into accepting Christ, I guess, or warning you about the apocalypse. Before we wrap it up, any good apocalypse films on your radar? I know Nick Cage appeared in, I guess appeared is the word. It was more like watching a man golf than it was watching an actor act. But the Left Behind film, did you go? Yeah, there? oh yeah, I watched that one very early on. I think before we even started again, when, when God Awful Movies was still a segment on Scathing Atheist, yeah. Um, that one was fun. That was a remake of the trilogy that Kirk Cameron did uh, you know, 20 years before that. Um, but I think that when, when, you, when it comes to rapture movies, the classic remains the uh, Thief in the Night trilogy yeah. uh, from the late 60s, early 70s. Um, those movies that traumatized every Christian my age and older. Uh, back right here. In, yeah. 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 yeah, jack me up. Um, you know, those movies were so carelessly horrific and such obvious and blatant nightmare fuel for children. I, I just, I don't think it's been done. I don't, I don't think that there's a better exemplar of that genre. It's one of those things where they freak out about the end of the world, but they're supposed to be looking forward to the end of the world. Right. Right. Christ is coming. I mean, the more shit goes down, the more we know we're this close to the greatest place beyond imagination that we will spend all eternity in joy and bliss and music with a family dog and whatever. And yet they spend all of this time losing their shit about the apocalypse. I mean, logically it makes no sense, right? Yeah, um, yeah. I think some of it is, again, the fetishizing that you're talking about, but fetishizing what's gonna happen to all those people that didn't listen to him, all of those people that beat him in arguments on Facebook and everything, you know, just that that revenge fantasy that they get to, that they get to live through when they're talking about the, the rapture. But yeah, then there's also, you know, there's some theologies that say that everybody has to live through the tribulation, and then there's the rapture. Some say the rapture comes before the tribulation. And so I think uh, a lot of the movies, for the sake of storytelling, uh, favor the former. Yeah, you got to go through the meat grinder. So now you've got the hero and the villain and conflict and all the plot devices that have to take place in a good story. What's that uh, line about uh, the old Tom and Jerry cartoons? Why doesn't Tom ever catch Jerry? And it's because, well, if he did, there would be no story. Right. Like, why didn't God kill Satan right off the bat? Well, if you do that, there's, there's no story, right? Uh, what are you guys uh, doing right now and what should people look for and how do they find you? You know, kind of give me a punctuation at the end of this sentence. Sure, yeah. So you can check out uh, The Scathing Atheist, God Off of Movies, The Skeptocrat, D&D Minus, Citation Needed. We do pretty much all the podcasts. Jesus Christ, now. how many podcasts are you involved with? We're, we're doing five now. Uh, so our goal is to eventually have you every day of the week. But uh, we, we, we're, so far we're leaving one for you, Seth. Like, are you, um, <laughs> <laughs> like you, I, are, are you on, are you having to do hallucinations? Mean, some sort of a, a, you know, is this jolt cola? Is this five hour energy? You know, whatever else you're doing to try to keep up with it or what? Well, most of it is working with some very talented people. You know, I, I work with Eli Bosnick and Heath Enright, very, both very prolific uh, comic thinkers uh, on Citation Needed. I work with Tom and Cecil from the Cognitive Dissonance podcast. So um, I've done, the, the, I, I work smart. I, I surround myself with really uh, brilliant people who work very, really hard and then I just kind of like, grab onto their coattails and hope I can hold on. That's a great group though, you know, and, and they're the kind of guys with no pretense, you could sit down with them and just, and just be, you know, and, and they really believe in what they're doing as do you. And I appreciate that. You know, you're, you're trying to, what's that Ingersoll quote, the more false we destroy, the more room there will be for the true, right? Unfortunately, there's a lot of false out there and you guys are not afraid to tackle it, even if it means being scathing. So thanks for your work and your friendship and happy birthday, brother. Thanks a lot.